Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be delivering today's keynote address on building the metaverse, scaling production of PMUTs for the future of human interaction. My name is Elisa Fitzgerald. I'm the CEO of AM Fitzgerald, a MEMS product development company based in the Bay Area. And today I'll be presenting the technology and products of our client Emerge, a Los Angeles area based startup company. For the past year and a half during the pandemic, we've been isolated from our loved ones, our friends, our colleagues, and we've had to make do with phone calls, with video web conferencing to stay in touch. Imagine if during this time, you would instead had access to a 3D environment where you could enjoy sight, sound, and touch while interacting with your loved ones. Imagine if you'd been able to hold your grandmother's hands while talking to her or toss a ball around with your young nieces and nephews, or even played a multiplayer game with your best friends. This is the product vision of Emerge. They are creating a new category of consumer product that allows you to physically feel, share emotions, and create in the metaverse. And if you've never heard the term metaverse before, it was actually coined in the early 1990s science fiction novel, Snow Crash, written by the author, Neil Stevenson. And he imagined a vivid alternate universe that you could enter just by putting a headset on. Emerge's product vision is called Emerge Home. It's a virtual social space where you can gather with your inner circle, enabled by a consumer device that's placed on the tabletop that now enables you to use your bare hands to physically feel and interact with people. You don't need any gloves. You don't need to hold a controller. You can just hover your hands over the device while wearing a VR headset. I've had the great pleasure to experience the Emerge product. It's really incredible. It can create sensations on your hands that are like touch, that feel like a pen drawing on your hand, that feel like tickling, and even some magical sensations that I can only describe as like a sparkly kind of electrostatic feeling. The Emerge product works as a system with a VR headset, third-party headsets such as the Oculus Quest, and they have created multiple fun environments in their Emerge mobile app, which you can choose to enter uh, with your friends and family. When you have a moment, click on the link that says play video. It'll take you to the Emerge website where you can see various vignettes that show how the product can be used. Now we're here at a conference with MEMS executives. So let's talk about how MEMS technology is powering this device. The Emerge device is what you see here, the silver square. It's about 12 inches or 30 centimeters on the side. It sits on your tabletop and inside are hundreds of ultrasound transducers. And the device actuates as a phased array where depending on how the transducers are actuated in sequence, it can steer a beam and control the ultrasonic field to create all these different sensations in your hands which are hovering over the device. At the moment, the transducers in this device are bulk ultrasonic transducers made from machine PZT. And this is the same kind of ultrasound transducer that you would find in the bumper of your car that's being used for backup, uh, the backup notification system in your vehicle. Now, in Emerge approached to Ann Fitzgerald, they knew that these bulk transducers were not gonna carry them all the way through to the production and commercialization plans that they had imagined. And they have some experienced MEMS people on their team and they knew that piezoelectric micromachined ultrasound transducers or PMUTs would probably be the best solution for reaching their commercialization goals. They figured it would be lower cost than a bulk transducer and importantly, in a chip scale format could enable them to use lower cost electronic assembly technology. They could take advantage of the automation and the volume scale that's available uh, versus the current mechanical based assembly. And furthermore, having the opportunity to design a new PMUT would enable them to further optimize their ultrasonic phased array performance versus the bulky transducer, which was made for an automotive application that they have today. So the challenge posed to us was how could they develop a MEMS, custom MEMS ultrasonic transducer and get it scaled into volume production as soon as possible? 
And based on their prior experiences with MEMS, they were all already aware too that MEMS companies have taken years and tens of millions of dollars to achieve similar goals. To give you a sense for the challenge ahead for Emerge, in orange, you can see their forecasted number of product units per year, starting with next year, where they're gonna roll out their product, incorporating these bulk ceramic transducers and produce about a thousand units next year. But in 2023, they wanna have MEMS in their product. And by 2025, they wanna be able to sell a thousand, excuse me, a million of their product units per year. Translated into 200 millimeter wafers, that means that the new PMUT has to be able to be manufactured in a volume of tens of thousands of wafers per year. So that's a big ramp up in volume production in a fairly short period of time. So when Emerge presented this challenge to Anne Fitzgerald, these are the strategies that we recommended to them. And to Emerge's credit, they embraced them, executed them, and also have made the budget available to execute these strategies going forward. And I'll outline the six strategies for you here, and then we'll talk about them in more detail in the coming slides. Number one, don't reinvent the wheel. It's a cliche, but it's often not followed. Number two, seek out help from experts when beginning. Number three, create a recurring unit cost model and test that against your business model assumptions. Number four, design for manufacturing immediately. And for MEMS wafers, that means design for foundry. Number five, use parallel development paths to mitigate risk. And number six, design for package and test immediately. So starting with number one, don't reinvent the wheel. If you don't need novelty in your MEMS device, we strongly urge you to go shopping for third-party technology. Emerge was, had some awareness of was, what was out there in the MEMS world, and they decided to seek out companies worldwide having MEMS ultrasound or microspeaker technology, rather than investing the time and money to invent its own. And they investigated multiple available technologies. Ultimately, they selected USound as a design partner to create a customized PMUT microspeaker. And many of you might already be familiar with USound. They are presenting during this conference. They already have in production an audible microspeaker. So Emerge knew that it could benefit from USound's experience and expertise, and USound had to produce a design to, that would modify their existing audible speaker design in order to produce ultrasound. Another benefit of working with a third party who's already got expertise and devices in production is that USound already had the supply chain available to create a concept prototype. So once they had created the new design for Emerge, they could fabricate the proof of concept prototype at nearby development fabs. So the result of employing this strategy is that Emerge was able to go from a signed design contract with USound to a first functional prototype in less than six months. And for those of you who are experienced MEMS veterans, you know that's a very short period of time for getting a working prototype of a new design. Number two, seek out help from experts when beginning. At AM Fitzgerald, we like to draw the analogy of MEMS product development. We like to use the analogy of going for a journey through the wilderness. If you're not an experienced outdoors person, it's only intuitive that if you're gonna embark on a journey through lands that you've never been through before, that you'll go faster and safer if you have an expert guide to show you the way, to teach you, to help you become stronger and to help you avoid pitfalls. Emerge, having some background with MEMS, knew this. They knew that they could benefit from outsource, outsourced expertise and that they could optimize their progress per unit dollar and per unit time in the early stages when they only had seed funding and series A funding. They knew that using outsourced experts could enable them to keep their employee headcount or their burn rate low while their cash is limited. And it would also provide more time for recruiting the right people in what is right now a very tight talent market. I think everyone in this audience is aware of just how hard it is to hire experienced hardware engineers right now. So Emerge has assembled a team of multiple experts for the specialized technical help that they need to create this complex product. They engaged Riversonic Solutions, which is an ultrasonic 
uh, Ultrasound uh, Consultancy, A.M. Fitzgerald for MEMS product development strategy, and also significantly to help them with foundry selection and transfer. They have engaged a PZT expert who is expert at PZT process integration in MEMS devices and process methodologies. They engaged Aspen Microsystems, which is a MEMS packaging and assembly consultancy, and recently CATI to help with some advanced acoustic structural finite element modeling. And Emerge's plan is to replace these outside experts eventually with internal company employees after the initial technical and product risks have been reduced and after they have increased their available funding. Number three, create a recurring unit cost model. Emerge knew that the MEMS development would only be worthwhile if it could really beat the bulk transducer unit cost. So AM Fitzgerald created a cost model to validate Emerge's hypothesis. Now, one additional advantage of working with experienced third parties is that Emerge could benefit from USOUND's production experience, from their cost data, from their yield data, and we were able to incorporate that real data into the cost model. And the conclusion was that yes, indeed, a MEMS PMUT would beat the bulk transducer cost by several factors. And in the diagram below, this gives you a simple flow chart for how you can create very basic cost models that are also very informative, just based on simple metrics like the die size, the forecast annual unit volume, and typical wafer pricing. And so even when your design is not yet finished, um, there's still a lot of unknowns about how you're gonna make your individual uh, MEMS device, this kind of flow chart and this kind of simple cost model can give you a very useful cost number to help validate your overall business model. Number four, design for manufacturing. And in the MEMS world, that means design for foundry immediately. So with Emerge's aggressive commercialization plan where they're gonna to have to rapidly scale up wafer volume in just a few short years, we knew that we had to start talking to foundries and foundries that had process platforms available to us immediately. We also knew that we're gonna need access to production quality PZT materials and etch processes in order to further optimize the PMUT design. And significantly, we were at a good point in the development to transfer to foundry. The design is there, but not totally frozen. So we could still make the adjustments needed to adapt the design for the foundry's existing process. One problem that often arises in MEMS product development is when the design has been hardened in isolation without being informed about what's available at the foundry, often when a customer has to transfer that frozen hardened design to a foundry, they realize that there's a mismatch and then time and money has to be spent redesigning for the foundry processes. Our advice to Emerge was, Let's get talking to foundries right away. Let's find out what processes are available and let's make sure we adapt the design for those processes and take advantage of the high quality materials that are available to finalize the PMUT design. And another advantage that Emerge has developed doing this development now is that piezoelectric materials are widely available at both 150 and 200 millimeter MEMS foundries. That was not the case 10 years ago. Strategy five, use parallel development paths to mitigate risk. Again, seems like an obvious strategy, but what we have found is most startups in particular are not funded, or if they do have the money, they are not willing to allocate funds to parallel development paths. Fortunately, Emerge was willing and able to do so, and there's several benefits that are gonna come from embracing parallel development paths. First of all, we had to answer an important question which is which type of PZT and foundry process is gonna deliver the best performance results. We knew that there was sol gel PZT out there. There's also sputtered PZT out there. So our choice was to select two foundries, one with each type of PZT and to run feasibility batches of both and then evaluate the foundry's performance and evaluate the wafers and make a decision about where to go from there. Other advantages of having two foundries working in parallel 
is that redundant sources mitigate business risk. It helps to hedge against delays, and for startups, product launch delays can be fatal. In today's world, we're also facing COVID-19, geopolitics, natural disasters. I think most everybody in our industry right now is looking for redundant sources to help mitigate their business plans, mitigate risk of it on their business plans. So Emerge, by embracing the strategy to use two foundries, now has great optionality to either keep two foundries and help assist in this rapid volume ramp up, or depending on what transpires, they could later down select to only one foundry. And I can share with you today that foundry one is the Japanese foundry Rome Semiconductor, and they're pursuing a 150 millimeter sol gel PZT process. And the Sweden based Silex Microsystems that is pursuing a 200 millimeter OLVAC PZT process. Now to expand a little bit more on general strategies for mitigating fabrication risk, one thing we have seen in our business is that a lot of startups, usually because they don't have adequate funding and sometimes they have naive notions on how much risk they're facing in the prototype phase, will start a batch at a foundry. Um, they will only start one batch. There'll be multiple interruptions and pauses to solve for process issues. And the typical outcome is that the first prototype is inadequate. And then they have to start the whole process over again. And if they're lucky, the second prototype round will be successful, but more typically it could take three or four or more. A better way to mitigate fab risk is to first do a PFMEA, process failure modes and effects analysis, to work with your foundry partner to analyze your design and the process steps and the tolerances and the different interactions and to spend some time anticipating where you might see problems, where there's inadequate data, and then to employ one or more of three strategies to try to mitigate that fabrication risk. When you know where you're likely to find the issues, you can create experiments or create simple tests to try to get the information you need to lower risk. So one common approach is to do short loops. These are little tiny sections of the overall process flow to test a certain process step or two, look at the results and use that to inform and de-risk the overall process flow. Another strategy is to do staging where you're starting all of the wafers together and you're going through the lower risk parts of the process. And then when you're starting to go into higher risk parts of the process, you set some wafers aside, you continue. And if you have an issue, you can always revert to the staged wafers and continue from there. Another option is to do a split lot where you can start a bunch of wafers, get to a point and then divide the wafer group in half and do A-B testing as you explore different variations on the process. Each and all of these processes or, or methods, uh, risk mitigation methods can be employed by the foundry. And as shown in the chart here, if they are employed cleverly and successfully, you're likely to save significant amount of time and end up with a successful prototype much faster than if you go through a serial approach. Now, these types of strategies, short loop staging and split lots, they do require more money upfront, but as most wise business people know, that if you're getting to a successful product faster, you're ultimately saving money in the long run because you're getting to market sooner. So Emerge and their foundry partners have been employing each of these strategies um, in the first feasibility launch, excuse me, first feasibility bashes. And I'm pleased to announce that we already are receiving wafers from each of the foundries uh, from, the, from the first feasibility runs. So number six, design for package and test immediately. Experienced medicine people know there is no product without the package. Uh, a lot of times we have seen in, in our practice at AM Fitzgerald, we have seen early stage startups focus on and fixate on getting the silicon chip to work. And they're very focused on the front end silicon and they're not even thinking about the package. They don't even wanna start thinking about the package until they get the silicon working. This is not, a good approach. There are multiple challenges that often arise in the interaction between MEMS and the package early on. 
and you must design from the very beginning for package compatibility. And even in that very first feasibility lot, you should be allotting first wafers for back end and assembly development efforts. You want to be surfacing any problematic interactions early on, and you want to be solving them early on. And furthermore, if you start looking at the, the package and the assembly steps, you can start to design. If you look at those early on, you can start to design for them and you can further optimize your overall product in integration process flow and especially the cost of the assembled product. MEM should be designed to accommodate package and test needs, such as adding fiducial marks that enable automated pick and place, putting down test structures that can be used for gathering materials property data in addition to the foundry process control monitors, and even very simple things like having bond pad locations in the right places so that your chip can very easily drop into an off the shelf package. So significant early on to get to working meaningful package prototypes. And with an acoustic device, we also need additional features in the package design, such as horns and waveguides to get the best performance as possible out of the PMA. So at AM Fitzgerald, we often think of MEMS product development as a journey. And we define that journey from first idea to sellable product as having five significant stages, proof of concept prototype, advanced prototypes, foundry feasibility, foundry pilot production, and foundry production. And colleagues might use different terminology. They might segment this journey slightly differently, but this is how we think of it. And Emerge started their proof of concept in 2020. And where we are today is at foundry feasibility with the first wafers coming from the foundry. And where we need to get to by 2023 is foundry production. What's up next for Emerge is expanding their Emerge Creator Studio. They are ultimately creating a UI, a platform that's going to enable third parties to build, publish, and monetize experiences that are using this tactile technology in ways that not everyone has yet imagined. And that's going to be uh, a creative platform to allow others to create however they might imagine the metaverse to be realized. Just a little bit about the two companies, uh, about Emerge and their team and investors. Um, they are a group of people who are deeply experienced in consumer device and gaming industries. Their team is composed of 70% immigrants and first-generation Americans, including the two founders. Um, these are folks who are very familiar with being separated from friends and family and colleagues. And they are very excited about their product technology to enable them to stay in better touch with the people that they care about in distant countries. At AM Fitzgerald, we provide development services to get clients to production and to market. Our services are focused on getting our clients from those initial ideas into production, into commercialization. We are bridging the development gap between TRL 3 and 7. We have recently uh, written a book that captures all of the methodologies and learnings from our 18 years in business. The company is based in Burlingame, California. We're right near the SFO airport. And a key part of our services to our customers is to assist them with advanced prototyping, which we do um, in the fab, the 150 millimeter UC Berkeley Marvell Nano Lab, where we're able to produce early prototypes to enable our customers to then later transfer to Foundry. So to summarize my pre presentation, MEMS PMUTs are gonna enable Emerge's exciting and unique product that is gonna help create a tactile metaverse and more immersive VR experiences. I hope I've impressed upon you that complex system products require collaborations among multiple expert partners, not just individual consultants, but also foundries, backend suppliers, vendors. Some simple, thoughtful strategies can really help to minimize cost, time, and risk of product development. And Emerge has embraced these strategies and are, is faithfully executing them. And we believe these strategies are gonna help them get into high volume production in just a few short years. And finally, 
it's never too early to consider volume manufacturing and assembly. If you do true design for manufacturing, it's going to enable your company and products to get to market fast. Here is some contact information for both Emerge and A.M. Fitzgerald. We welcome your questions. We welcome you to reach out to us by email, and we hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you.